chapter 2. I'm going to read from chapter 1 and verse 19 just to pick up the train of thought as Peter writes. We have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought, brought a flood upon the world of, ungo of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willfully, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as, they, as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishing, blemishes, reveling in their deception while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked, but was rebuked <clears throat> for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been far better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You would have noticed as we begun this letter, if 
few weeks ago that in chapter 1 of this letter, Paul is addressing the Christians, those who have a faith of like standing with their own, with the apostles. And then he writes about the image of a Christian, the calling and the election of a Christian and how he's to make his calling and election sure and the qualities that needs to be exhibited by a Christian. Those who have the faith must add to their faith virtue, and to their virtue knowledge, self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And the reason for this, Paul, Peter is convinced, is worth it, since he is a man about to, to die for his faith. After he has followed the Lord for some time, he is persecuted for his stance in the gospel. And so he brings to the, to the churches, to the Christians, the message of a dying man. The question is, what is worth living for? And Peter answers that question. It's worth living your life for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to obey him in everything. And the reason for that, as we saw last week, is because of the prophetic word. God speaking to us, God revealing himself to us, God giving us his word and his promises so that through his promises we might have life. And so now as we come this evening to chapter 2, we see the opposite picture. We see a picture here of the false teachers, of the false prophets that comes among the people of God. We see Peter saying, don't be surprised. There were false prophets that arose among the people in history. There were false prophets among the people of God all throughout history and even in his own day. And he doesn't expect that to end. He says there will be. Notice the future tense in the first couple of verses. There will be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring destructive heresies. Many will follow them. The way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. And so, do not be surprised when they do arise. Do not be, a, be surprised when you do see them. Know that they will be there. And now you might think, well, what is our hope then? If there will be these false people that rise up. Isn't the hope of the gospel that all of those who are against God would be wiped out and destroyed? Why is it that we still have to live among them? Why is it that Peter says they will still be among us? that we must watch out for them. Weren't they destroyed by the cross of Christ? You see, the victory that Christ had worked on the cross was the beginning of the victory over Satan and the dominion of darkness. And the beginning of his kingdom was ushered in when he came to minister, to die on the cross, and when he was raised. And as he ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of God until the Lord would make all of his enemies a footstool, you see? Until all of the enemies will be made a footstool. And so there's still time for the wicked and the ungodly to continue in their wickedness and their ungodliness. The wisdom here is found in Jesus' parable about the wheat and the tares. No, let them grow together, lest you tear up some of the wheat that, that's growing amongst the tares. It's for the sake of the wheat that the tares are not torn out immediately. It's for the sake of the children of God that the wicked are not judged immediately. We see when Peter says here that in their greed they will exploit you. You will find yourself from time to time entangled in these falsehoods. And so the danger is when God's people are entangled and the judgment comes upon them too soon, that God has not yet separated his people from them. You see, this is the grace of God for us at this time, is the process of separation. The process of separation. And it takes time to recognize, to recognize, is this plant growing up, is it a wheat or is it a tear? What is it? Let's, let's test it. Let, let it grow for a bit. Let us pour water upon it. Let's Minister to the people and see what fruit they produce in the gospel. 
to know whether or not they are fruitful for the gospel or whether or not they are not of the gospel. And so in this time, we have hope in the Lord. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9 of the central comfort of this text. We see verse 9 open with the word then. We just saw a long list of if, if, if from verse 4. If all of these things are true from verse 4 up until verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. You see, the Lord does two things here. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. That's the first important thing we must know and take comfort in. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, even the trials of the false teachers in the midst of his people. The Lord knows how to rescue them. The second thing is the Lord knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. The wrath of God is upon such people even now. They go around mocking the Lord saying, if the Lord wants to destroy me, let him strike me down at this moment. And then they laugh when the Lord does not do it. At that very moment. Who are you to tell the Lord when to judge? He will judge you soon enough. But it's up to his timing. He's not going to pay attention to the mocking and the calling out of a puny little false prophet like you. He doesn't have to listen to your instruction. He's not your dog. You see? Now, before we get to this comfort in verse 9, we must first recognize here the opposition and the identity here of the false prophets. As I read here about the false prophets who arose among the people, as the false prophets will be, they will bring in, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. We see here the contrast between the call of the godly in chapter 1, those who have faith, who add to that faith, moral excellence to that moral excellence, self-control to self-control, steadfastness and so on, and they grow in godliness and they grow in love. Here is the opposite process at work with these false teachers. The first thing you notice about them is their unorthodox teaching. And their unorthodox teaching is not in the detail of the doctrine, maybe. Because you don't recognize them bringing in their secret and destructive heresies. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Why is it secretive and destructive? Because of the second part, denying the master who bought them. They would want you to get entangled about debates over form and doctrine. Want you to get entangled in the details of thinking about the end times. What will it be like when Jesus comes and what will be the signs of his coming and to keep you busy with those things. Keep you busy with the genealogy. Why do we have these genealogies in the Bible? Look at this. Look at this doctrine. What do you think about this thing or that thing? What's your opinion of this text? How do you understand this word in this verse? All of these things good. That's why it's happening without notice. That's why the heresies come in unnoticed. Because it has the appearance of godliness. It has the appearance of right doctrine. But pay careful attention. Pay careful attention while they bring in these destructive heresies, they deny the master who bought them. The question is, the teaching should be measured according to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. 
When this person brings this doctrine, is he submissive to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or not? We saw it this morning with the scribes and the Pharisees. While they lay upon the people heavy burdens and say to them and command them, the Lord says this, the Lord says this, while they themselves do not lift a finger to do what the Lord commands. Be careful of those who would teach you, doesn't the Lord, Lord require of you to do this and this and this and this? And when you look at them, you see, well, I don't see your example. I don't see how you've set the example of living this way. You tell me to live in this way, and I, when I look at you, I see the complete opposite of what you're requiring me to do. You see, the authority does not come from, from them. They make the authority of the Word of God useless. That's why Jesus spoke like one with authority. And the people were astounded by the authority that he had when he taught. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees who had no authority. Because they themselves did not lift a finger as we saw, as we said, to do these things. But Jesus spoke as one with authority. Why could he speak with that authority? Because he submitted to the will of his Father. At every point, he did what his Father had commanded him. He came to do the will of his Father perfectly and to call others to do the same. That's why, as we saw this morning, when, when Paul says to the Corinthian church, imitate me, he's standing in sharp contrast to what we see the false teachers being. You see, the false teachers would tie you down to certain words and things and not to an example of godliness. Not to an example of godliness. And so we as men in the congregation, those of us who would aspire to eldership and those who would lead our families must recognize these things. See it in the world around us and recognize where we are tempted to do the very same thing in our own household. Where we try and dictate to our family or try and give our family the word of God while we do not lift a finger to do what the Lord has commanded us. That's why there is such ineffectiveness in your family, if this is indeed the case, when you examine yourself. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to be very, very careful and attentive. We need to be a careful and attentive, as the Bible tells us, as the Lord warns us, listen to my word, pay careful attention to my word. And this is exactly what Peter has done. He said, pay attention to the word. Verse 19 of chapter 1. We have something more sure to which you will do well to pay attention. As if you pay attention to the word of God. When your attention is focused there, you will not be seduced by the false teachers. You see, what is your remedy against their unorthodox teaching? Is to pay attention not to their words. Not to their interpretation of Scripture, but to pay attention to the Word of God. To pay attention to the Word of God. How is it that you pay attention to the Word of God? Yes, I listen and I hear and I can parrot what, what I just read. That's not listening to the Word of God. Listening to the Word of God is like Jesus saying to His disciples, When someone hears my word... And does what I command, he will be likened to a wise man building his house on a rock. This is listening to the word of God. When you take his word and you obey him. But the one who hears his word and does not do what he says. Will be likened like the man who builds on the sand. And when the time of trouble comes, his house falls. And so we see that's the firstly the unorthodox teaching of the false teachers. The second thing, this is not necessarily a mark only of false teachers, popularity, the second mark. We see their popularity. Now, I want to be careful, just because something is popular doesn't necessarily mean it's all wrong. But it, it's worth looking into. If something is too popular, you must ask yourself the question, why is it popular? If it's appealing to the masses, if it's appealing to the world, Something is not right. 
Something is not right when it is too popular among carnal, fleshly people. When too many carnal and fleshly people, when the world looks upon things with pleasure and approval, when the world looks upon these Christian teachers, so-called, these false teachers, and applaud them, and they are popular in the world with carnal men and women, you must wonder. You must be careful. We see in verse 2, many will follow their sensuality. And it's not clear to me whether it's their own sensuality or the sensuality of the false teachers, but what's the difference? Sensuality is sensuality. That's leading into the, th the third point, the, th the free morality, the sensuality of it all. Whatever you feel is right, do whatever you want. I'll do as I please. That's free morality. The sensuality, just following the passions of your own flesh. No consideration for the word of God as we saw. Pay attention to the word of God to obey the word of God. These teachers have no desire to listen and to do. No desire. And so those who follow them in their passions have no desire to listen and to hear. They did not pay heed and take, take attention to the word of God in warning them. And so they become entangled with these false teachers, these false prophets. We see then in the fourth place, their evangelism is marred. Marred evangelism. Because of verse 2, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. How is it that the way of truth will be blasphemed because of them? These teachers, they say this and this from the pulpit. When you look at their churches, look how their people behave. Look at how they themselves behave. The hypocrites telling others to behave in this way while they themselves will not obey the Lord. And so the way of truth is blasphemed. Because while they declare that they know the way and that they can show the way, they themselves are not on the path of righteousness and sanctification and holiness. It's like the Pilgrim's Progress with Mr. Worldly Wiseman dressing up so nicely, saying there's an easy way to heaven. And when Christian takes the easy way, what does he find? It's hard. It's extremely hard. Because he followed his own passion in wanting the easy way. In wanting the easy way. We often think our way is easier. God's way is too hard. My way is easier because I just need to follow my feelings. Follow your heart. Trust your heart. What does the Bible say about your heart? The heart is wicked. Desperately ill. Desperately wicked. And lastly, we see the false teachers and their suspect, suspect motives. When you wonder, why is it that you do what you do? What motivates your, your teaching? What motivates, what motivates you? What animates you? Look at verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. They love things in their greed. It's actually their covetousness, their desire for every and other thing. Oh, you have a nice car. Oh, you have a nice house. Oh, I wish I had what you had. Try and flatter you with their words. In the meantime, desiring and coveting what you have. You will know them by these marks. You will know them by these marks. <clears throat> now, we might be tempted to despair because of verse 2. We're tempted to despair because many will follow their sensuality. Many. So firstly, we had an introduction into the false teachers, and secondly, we have an introduction to the many. Many. In Matthew 24 and verse 10, Jesus warns his disciples, Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. 
but the one who endures to the end will be saved. You see, Peter took to heart what Jesus warned him about. Matthew 24 is where they sat on the mountain and the disciples pointed out the temple. And then they asked, what will be the signs of your coming? And then Jesus said, this will be the signs of the coming. And he talks about the false prophets and the trials and turbulations that will come. But the most important thing that he tells them in that chapter is the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the reason that's the high point or the climax there is because Jesus told them that they must pay attention to themselves. Do not let these things worry you. Don't let the signs of the time worry you too much. That's what he says in Matthew 24. Do not worry too much about these signs. Do not let these things worry you. But pay attention to yourself. Pay attention to your growth and godliness. Because the one who will endures to the end will be saved. It doesn't help to sit and look at the world around you and say, Oh, all of this wickedness, what's my hope? You will be hopeless when you look at these things or you put your trust in changed circumstances. The thing is, the Lord has prepared you for precisely this kind of circumstance. He's made you aware of the circumstances you will face as a Christian in order that you may be prepared for them. And to give you His promise, the one who endures to the end will be saved. In Matthew chapter 7, in verse 13, we see Jesus saying to his disciples, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Those who find it are few. We further see it in the warning of Jesus later on in Matthew 7 from verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Many will say this. What does Jesus say to them? Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. You list all these things. You say, I'm a Christian. Look at me. This is what I do. Duk, duk, duk. Lord, you must let me enter. I'm a Christian. Jesus, don't you recognize a Christian when you see one? In other words, how, how the surprise of many will be on that day. Jesus, don't you recognize a real Christian? Can you think... 2 Peter 2 and verse 3, we see, And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Here, Peter shows us, Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Peter is saying that they're under imminent danger. They're in imminent danger. At any moment, their world can come crumbling down. They can be destroyed in an instant. The personification here of their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their condemnation is heaping up. It's becoming more and more. It's becoming more and more severe as they heap up more unrighteousness on unrighteousness on unrighteousness. They're heaping up wrath for themselves in the day of wrath to come. Instead of growing in grace upon grace upon grace and receiving more and more of God's blessing, they only darken and darken and darken and darken themselves. You see the difference in the path here where Christians are called to grow in godliness, grow in sanctification, grow in godliness, they are going down the stream of their own sensuality, going to their swift destruction. And then we get into verse 4, the if God. And this is our hope. This is where our hope begins. As Peter lists for us three examples from history, three examples from redemptive history to point out how God's judgment is upon the wicked 
and how God knows how to save and to rescue the righteous. Pay attention. Verse 4 is the first example. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now pay attention how this unfolds. There are three ifs. Verse 4, if God did not spare. Verse 5, if he did not spare. Verse 6, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned. So if I can shorten it a little bit. Verse 4, if God did not spare. Verse 5, if he did not spare. Verse 6, if he condemned. Verse 7, if he rescued. Verse 9, then he knows. If God has done all these things that I'm about to list right now, then God knows. And so if you look at all of these examples that he gives, do you know, do you trust that the Lord has done this? Do you believe the testimony of Scripture that God has done this? Because if you do, if you believe that God is true, then the comfort of verse 9 is for you. The first thing is in verse 4, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. You see, God has judged the angels who have sinned against him already. He has cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness already, as Peter is writing here. Look at Jude. Jude here talks about the same thing. Jude 1 from verse 5. Jude writes about the same instance. Jude reminds the Christians, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. We see in Matthew 8, as Jesus heals a man who is demon-possessed, Matthew 8 and verse 28, when he came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have, we to, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Have you come here to torment us before the time? You see, the point of this first example is that God is more mighty than any of his creatures, even the glorious angels that are stronger and more than we as, as men. Even these glorious angels who are stronger than us, those who have rebelled against the Lord are not stronger than he is. If God is able to judge them, if he did judge them, in fact, if he did commit them to chains of gloomy darkness until the day of judgment, if they will not escape the judgment of God, how much less would you and I escape? How much less would the wicked escape the judgment of God? Do not be fooled. No one, no one will escape the judgment day of God. In Matthew 25 and verse 41, we see when Jesus sits on the throne separating the sheep from the goat, we see, he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is not just a place for lost sinners, lost men. It's a place for Satan and his angels, for all of those creatures who rebel against the Lord. And so if God has done this with the angels, the first example, the second example, if he did not spare Again, the same word, if he did not spare the angels, if he did not spare the ancient world. You see, he did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah. You see, here is the contrast between the righteous and the unrighteous. He did not spare the unrighteous, but he preserved the righteous with the very same act of judgment. Can you see that? Can you see the wonder of God in in the very same act of sending rain, he condemns the, the unrighteous and he saves the righteous with the very same judgment. He did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah. 
Noah, who was a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. How did he preserve Noah? He preserved Noah by commanding him to build an ark according to the specifications that God had shown him. Who saved Noah? God saved him through the ark. Noah needed to lay hold by faith of the prom in the promises of God. If Noah had said, ach, big flood, really? Come on, that's just a storybook story, Jesus. That's just a storybook story, God. Don't believe in the global flood. You see, Noah laid hold of the word of God by faith and he, in obedience, built the ark. Even while the people were mocking and scoffing at him. He's a herald of righteousness. God told me to build the ark. I'm laying hold of the warning and the word of God. And through that, he was preserved. Through the ark, entering into the ark by faith, he was preserved. The third example, you must pay very close attention to this. Well, this is a remarkable example. Why would we be turning to Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot? If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, God condemned them to extinction... If God has done this, if God has meted out judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's done this, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. The ungodly will be judged like Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. Verse 7 then, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. Did God rescue righteous Lot? Yes, so if God had done this, if God had done this, you can ask the question, did God do this? Yes. Did he do this? Yes. Did he do that? Yes. If he had done this, then he knows, verse 9. But let us look closely, verse 7 and 8, about Lot. If he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, then we have this in, in brackets. For as that righteous man lived among them. As that righteous man lived among them. Day after day. Pay very close attention. Some of you might not have the ESV in front of you. But this is what my ESV reads. He was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Now some of your translations may sound a little bit different, but let me explain to you what's going on in the sentence. There's someone tormenting him, tormenting Lot. The question is who? Who is doing the tormenting? The point is, in the Greek sentence, the righteous man living among them. This is the full identification of the person. This is all in the nominative singular in the Greek. This is the person doing the action. He is the one tormenting his soul. The righteous person living among them is tormenting his own soul. Lot did not separate himself from Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the story of Lot. When Lot had the option, when Lot had the, to choose where he will go and live, he went to live in Sodom and Gomorrah amongst the wicked. He knew of the wickedness among them. He left Abraham, the righteous servant of the Lord, separated himself from Abraham to go and live in Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the Lord calls him out, what does Lot do? He lingers. He lingers. He doesn't get up immediately to go, you see. But he's called a righteous man. But you see, he's a righteous man tormenting his own soul and entangling himself in the wickedness of those around him. That is precisely what we said at the beginning, why the Lord does not mete out destruction on the ungodly and the false teachers immediately. It's for that principle to let the righteous and the unrighteous grow together so that the righteous do not succumb with the unrighteous. It's part of God's preserving and saving grace because this is exactly the saving grace that he has for righteous lot Can you imagine righteous Lot 
being distressed and grieved by the wickedness of the people. And the Lord could have easily just said to him, well, you, you did this to yourself. How easy is, is it for us not to say, oh, well, he brought this destruction upon himself. How many of us would do what the Lord has done to rescue Lot? Why would Abraham go to rescue Lot in the instances where he needed to go and rescue Lot when Lot was captured also while he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, captured by the other kings? When Lot had looked and chosen the best portion for himself, when he should have deferred to Abraham, who was much older than he, saying, no, you should choose first. In his arrogance, in his lovelessness, he did this. But there is the hope and the comfort for us, for we are no better than Lot. We behave very much like Lot. As Christians, we, we are slow and slack sometimes to believe the promises of God. We entangle ourselves with the world. We refuse to separate ourselves from unrighteousness. But the Lord will separate us. The Lord knows how to rescue righteous lot and so verse 9 then the lord knows how to rescue the godly you see if he preserved no one if he rescued lot he knows how to rescue the godly from trials even the trials that are self-inflicted like the trials of lot it's again the lord does not owe you grace he does not owe us any of his mercy and grace but this is part of the majesty of his love and his steadfastness and his steadfast love toward us and his long suffering and patience with us to rescue us from these trials. If he knows how to rescue the righteous, he knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. He knows how to keep them. No one will escape his righteous judgment. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you will escape his judgment. The Lord will judge. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, as we have heard your word, that you declare to us the great comfort, that you know how to rescue the godly and the righteous, and that you also know how to judge the wicked. We pray, O oh Lord, that the desire of our heart would be to be more and more righteous, and not to entangle ourselves more and more with unrighteousness, but to keep our eyes open, to pay attention, to be warned by your word, to love you and to serve you, so that we will not entangle ourselves with this world. Father, in the words of Paul, when he asks, what then shall we say to these things? If you are for us, who can be against us? Father, you did not spare your own son, but gave him for us all. And we thank you. And we thank you that with him, you will grant us all things by your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that there is no one to bring a charge against your elect, against those who you have justified, against those who you have pronounced free. There is no one to condemn us in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, as we lay hold of this promise, as we lay hold of the grace by faith in Christ Jesus, We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be more and more transformed into the image of Christ Jesus. As indeed you have promised in your word that the gospel power is leading to the transformation of your people. As Jesus died for our sin, but more than that, 
as he is raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of you in heaven. We thank you that he is interceding for us. No one will be able to separate us from your love. That no tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword will separate us from the love of Christ. But Father, we pray that you preserve us through all tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, and danger in the sword as we depend upon your spirit as all of these things happen to us and around us. We pray that we would humbly continue to depend on your spirit and that this humble dependence would not lead to a permanent groveling before you but that it would lead to a humble, upright walk before the God of our salvation as you call us to walk upright in the way of Christ. Humility that we exhibit then, we pray, Lord, that it would be a humility of submission to you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.